Hello and welcome to Rocky Mountain Institute's webinar on demand flexibility. This is Mark Dyson. I'll introduce myself in a minute here. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and let you know that I'm going to give people another minute or two to join and then we'll launch into the presentation and discussion. Great. Um, so again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to start the presentation now. Um, so again, this is Mark Dyson. Um, my colleague Kara and I will be talking about the report that we just released, um, Demand Flexibility, the Key to Enabling a Low-Cost, Low-Carbon Grid. And I've included the link here on the first slide, uh, just as a reminder to folks that uh, the document that we're discussing today can be accessed publicly on our website, and you can't click on the link. I apologize for that, but you can um, just look at RMI's website, and it'll show up pretty much at the top. So in today's webinar, we'll take about maybe 30 to 40 minutes discussing the context, the approach, and the main results of our recent study. Um, we're going to ask people to uh, we're going to ask people to enter questions into the chat box um, just to keep it simple and avoid uh, people talking over one another. We're going to address those questions mostly at the end of the presentation, but any clarifying questions that are important to address in a timely fashion, we will try to address in real time. Um, again, folks are going to remain muted, um, and, and again, we ask you to enter questions just via text. We are recording this session, and it will be shared with everyone who joined uh, sometime tomorrow once we've gotten it uploaded to our website. Um, and you can share any feedback or questions or uh, any other outreach via the email address on this slide, elab at rmi.org. So the agenda for the discussion today, we're going to introduce ourselves, Karen and myself. Um, we'll try to lay a little bit of the context around why we chose to uh, study this question and really what we mean by demand flexibility and what we see as the opportunity. We'll walk through a little bit of detail about how we actually undertook the study and went through the modeling exercises. And then we'll share the, the key results and the implications that we see out of those results. And at the end, we'll uh, capture any big questions that folks have raised and, and have a, a discussion uh, of our pers perspective on those questions. So just wanted to introduce ourselves briefly. Uh, I'm Mark Dyson. I'm a principal with Rocky Mountain Institute uh, within our electricity program. I lead our work on grid infrastructure planning, resource planning, uh, investment analysis, uh, with a particular focus on renewable energy and distributed energy resources, including demand flexibility. Uh, Kara, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Um, hi, I am an associate with the electricity team. I mostly focus on uh, regulatory policy reforms and changes to the utility business model in order to support the integration of uh, DERs. I work with our team in Hawaii, providing uh, mostly analysis and strategic guidance to the PUC there on their reforms to achieve 100% renewable energy. And I also am the co-author of RMI's 2016 report, Driving Integration, which focused on regulatory questions related to EV growth. Great. Thanks, Mark, back to you. 
So I'm going to talk through the first few slides really on the context for why we chose to study this topic and why uh, the study that we've done is important in the resource planning context and the investment opportunity facing the grid in the United States. Um, I think the, the, the piece of contextual information that is important to realize here is that the United States uh, grid relies on an aging fleet of generators that if you look at average retirement age of different kind of generating assets in the United States, and this is what the chart is showing. So you stack up everything that was operating in 2016 based on the latest EIA data, and you start looking at when those kinds of assets retire based on their age. Um, we're going to see more than half the nuclear fleet come offline. We're going to see more than half of the coal fleet come offline. And actually, this, this chart doesn't reflect the latest retirement announcements that have come through in 2018. So that, that retirement bar for coal would be even bigger. And you're going to take about half of the gas fleet offline as well. So these are some of the older gas-fired power plants that were built in the, the, the 70s through the 90s um, that are going to come offline over the next 15 years. And by 2030, we're going to lose about half of the generating capacity in the United States. Um, and so we're, there, there's a tremendous opportunity to rebuild the grid with something. And increasingly, that something is looking like renewable energy. And I'm showing here the most recent benchmark prices from the last 10 years, as well as the most recent forecast prices for wind and solar energy. And we've, we've seen just dramatic, dramatic price declines in the last 10 years for wind and solar. And then if you look out past the vertical line, you, out into the, the 2020s, the 2030s, uh, expert analysts are forecasting that these prices are going to fall even further. So these, these resources are quickly becoming the default investment choice for new energy investment in the United States. But we've already begun to see some of the uh, issues with rapid adoption of renewable energy. So this chart is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. It shows the um, realized revenues of solar PV projects in California since 2011. And so the, the dots are, are plotted on the axis of how much uh, energy solar provided to California in that year. And then the y-axis is how much revenue solar projects earned in California that year relative to average wholesale energy prices. So what you're seeing here is in 2011 and 2012, when solar made up less than 1% of the energy generated in California, it was earning, say, 25% above average market price because it tended to produce during more or less peak hours of the day. In 2013, 2014, 2015, as solar started producing 2, 4, 5, 6% of annual energy in the state due to rapid adoption, the revenues for solar started declining dramatically. And so in 2014, they were break even with average market prices in the state. And by 2017, this is reflecting year to date spring of 2017, that was when this report was published. By 2017, we saw that solar is providing nine to 10% of annual energy in California, but realizing revenues 50% below average market clearing prices because there was so much solar uh, and it was depressing the price so much. And I'll talk through that in a second. So this, this has created a little bit of uh, hyperbole, right? And we, we, we've, we've read headlines that suggest that there is, quote, turmoil in the wholesale markets, that there are terrifyingly low merchant revenues available to new uh, generators, uh, new wind and solar generators that get built. And this has led some analysts to suggest that wind and solar have economic limits associated with them, that as you build more and more and more, they become less and less and less valuable. 
and that there is a, kind of a limit to the economic adoption of these resources that we are rapidly approaching. So why, why does that happen? I'll just quickly walk through kind of the, the, the microeconomics 101 explanation of what's going on here. So this graph shows a marginal supply curve of energy uh, for, um, this is based on the Texas uh, grid. And what the x-axis shows is how many gigawatts of generating capacity are available uh, to produce energy. What the y-axis shows is how much it costs each unit, which is represented by a dot here, how much it costs each unit to generate electricity on a marginal basis, dollars per megawatt hour. So, you know, what, what we would do is we would draw a line down the graph that says, okay, well, demand is this much. Say it's 110 gigawatts. Wherever that demand line intersects that supply curve, say $100 a megawatt hour, that's what the price is going to be during that hour. That's what every generator would earn during that hour. But let's say we have 40 gigawatts of renewables, which is, you know, reflective of the very high renewable case we're modeling in this study. If we have very high renewables and at a certain hour of the day, um, we have 40 gigawatts of renewable available, all of a sudden that pushes the net demand curve down to 70 gigawatts. It pushes the clearing price down to say $40 per megawatt hour, thus dramatically reducing the revenues of not only the wind or solar generators that are pushing that supply curve down, but also um, the, uh, the fossil generators as well. So this is kind of the underlying market fundamentals that we're dealing with and the kind of economic uh, analytical basis for, for the study that we're going to present. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kara to walk through the opportunity for demand flexibility and kind of what we did and what we found as part of this study. Kara? And I'll give you control, great. Kara, so you can click through the slides. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. So um, demand flexibility, in short, uh, leverages the opportunity to shift load to better match the supply of renewables. Um, it uses new communication and control technologies to allow loads to continuously respond to changing renewable supply levels and other market signals as well. So, uh, thanks. So, right here we see the load. Sorry. Okay, here we see the load of a simulated residential customer in Hawaii and how it corresponds with the supply of solar. The top profile shows the business as usual changes in household load throughout the day. The below profile, however, shows what can happen with demand flexibility. Using technologies such as battery storage, managed DV charging, um, smart air conditioning controls, this household is able to shift electricity consumption to the middle of the day when PV generation peaks. Now, Mark just described uh, what happens on the market with high levels of renewable penetration. So beyond the household, demand flexibility also has a significant impact on the grid. Um, as Mark described, with greater variable renewable energy, uh, prices tend to reduce on the wholesale market. However, demand flexibility can mitigate this impact on price by increasing demand at times of high renewable availability. Demand flexibility can increase the clearing price of renewable energy and thus the resulting revenues of renewable projects. So, what's happening today? Uh, sorry, went a little too fast. There we go. So, traditional demand response programs have been around for years, sending consumers signals to reduce consumption during times of high stress on the grid. But demand flexibility, on the other hand, takes a different approach. Instead of focusing on curtailing energy use, Demand flexibility actually shifts energy use while still maintaining the same level of daily electricity consumption. So two different programs are presented here. 
Um, both are designed to help reduce peak loads and benefit distribution operations. Uh, as you can see, these programs are interacting with a number of participants, leveraging demand and flexibility in different ways. Uh, one using ice energy storage and the other using grid interactive water heaters and smart thermostats. Uh, both of these programs, the utilities are able to control um, the devices in the aggregate uh, under certain parameters. So that brings us to our study, which was focused on the question of what role can demand flexibility play in future renewable integration? So here you see um, our framework and modeling approach used. We really wanted to look at the potential demand flexibility can have in a highly renewable future if deployed at scale. So first off, we chose to model ERCOT the, the electricity wholesale market in Texas uh, in 2050 because of its significant, significant renewable growth potential and it also represents um, an islanded system from the larger U.S. grid. So we first assessed the potential of flexibility in eight residential and commercial end use loads that are included on this slide. And, and these loads don't necessarily need to be continuously running to meet customer, customer needs, which is critical. Uh, using RMI's 2012 reinventing fire analysis of forecasted load by major end uses in 2050, we were able to parameterize the load from each end use included in the model. This load forecast included also uh, expected addition, additional load from EV penetration. We also used uh, the reinventing fires output to model a hypothetical 2050 generation mix in our pot. We used the reinventing fires forecast to model hourly renewable energy supply and we assume that 60% came from variable renewable energy, being wind and solar. 20% came from inflexible resources, such as geothermal. And the remaining 20% consisted of flexible gas fire generation. To calculate net load, we subtracted the power generated from wind and solar from total load for each hour of the day. In each, in each day of the year. We then simulated hourly load shifting from high net load hours to hours of high renewable availability using our identified eight flexible levers. Daily energy use was kept the same to maintain the same level of services to customers. All right, I'm just having some technical difficulties changing the slide here. There we go. So uh, this slide shows the impact of wind and solar have on total demand throughout a day in our forecast. As you can see, the blue curve, which is the net load curve, uh, bellies out around midday and then quickly ramps up in the afternoon hours hitting its peak between about 6 and 8 p.m. Uh, many are familiar with this as being characterized as the duck curve. In our analysis, we assume that renewable energy could be curtailed during the hours of the day when net load drops below the level of inflexible energy on the system, which again was assumed to be 20% of annual energy supply. So given that, what is the impact of demand flexibility on the grid? So our suite of demand flexibility levers can significantly mitigate these concerns that we saw on the previous slide. The blue dashed line you see on this chart represents the old net load curve, and the green line is what results from demand flexibility. As this chart shows, demand flexibility flattens the net load curve, brings down the peak, 
and reduces that afternoon ramping. While the contributions from each of these technologies all vary, you can see their impacts as the load from afternoon peak demand moves to the middle of the day when the sun is high in the sky. So here we estimated the various impacts of demand flexibility using that new net load curve presented on the previous slide. Again, this new net load is the result of shifting demand from times of high net load to high renewable availability. Uh, to get the value of renewable generation, we estimated the hourly clearing prices for wholesale energy based on matching the supply curve of dispatchable resources with hourly net load. To get the value of renewable energy with flexibility, we matched that new net load curve with the same supply curve, which gave us the change in wholesale prices. Using this same supply curve, we are also able to estimate the change in annual curtailment on the system before and after demand flexibility is implemented. Again, renewable energy is curtailed during the hours when net load dips below the level of inflexible generation on the system. Uh, additionally, you could see we found that demand flexibility lowers peak net load by 24%, reduces ramping by 56%, and avoids 23% of annual carbon dioxide emissions. I now turn it back to Mark to discuss the costs associated with using demand flexibility. Great, thanks, Kara. So we, we just walked through what are the benefits that, that we saw on the grid from our study, but just as important as the cost side of the equation. So we're representing the cost here um, using the supply curve uh, diagram that I'm showing on the slide right now. Um, so what we've shown on this slide is all eight of the flexibility levers that we looked at. We quantified, um, one, how many megawatt hours of curtailment they could avoid. Uh, that is essentially equivalent to how many megawatt hours of gas generation they are avoiding, because when you avoid curtailment by shifting load, you also avoid gas generation that otherwise would have been used. So that's, that's the x-axis for each of these blocks that you're seeing on the graph. And we ran the model essentially in series for each of these, uh, each of these uh, flexibility levers. So you're seeing the, the total effect here. So the, the total sum of the x-axis is essentially the full technical potential that we've modeled. And you're, you're seeing what I'll call the interacted effects of reduced curtailment for some of these farther out to the right items on the supply curve. Um, and then I'll, I'll dive into that again in a second. So again, the bar width represents the, the load shifting potential that we were able to model. The bar height represents the, um, I'll call it the annualized uh, cost of enabling that flexibility divided by how many megawatt hours you were able to avoid curtailing. So you can think of this as how much do I have to spend uh, on kind of an annualized basis to avoid one megawatt hour of renewable energy curtailment. And then you'll see a bunch of these actually show up as negative. Um, so the important thing about the y-axis is that we're netting out the value of avoided peak demand um, in addition, or sorry, before we show the, the cost of avoiding curtailment. So, for example, commercial heat, um, enabling demand flexibility through commercial heating loads by installing essentially ceramic bricks to store heat and, and you know, generate heat uh, in off-peak hours, that has a significant peak reduction uh, effect because many of these other levers only really uh, have peak reduction effects in the summer in Texas, for example, air conditioning. But there are significant peak loads in the winter in Texas um, that we can offset through 
commercial heating demand flexibility. And that's why this has such a dramatically uh, low number is because it, it offers great peak reduction potential, but the bar is really narrow, meaning it doesn't actually provide that many annual megawatt hours of avoided curtailment. And what I was saying before about recognizing that this curve shows kind of the interacted effects of all of these levers operating essentially one after another, that's important for the the items that show up on the right of the supply curve, which you might read as being more expensive than the others. However, the fact that these uh, two ice storage technologies show up on the, the right end of the supply curve essentially reflects, and the, the, uh, then residential heating as well shows up on the right end, that is essentially reflecting the fact that we ran those uh, demand flexibility models last after we already modeled the flexibility of electric vehicles, of electric water heaters, of plug loads. Um, and so what, what you're seeing is that those um, end uses that are on the right of the supply curve, they are actually, if you only did them, if you only ran them and didn't do anything else, they would be between 30 and 90% more cost effective, kind of 30 to 90% lower uh, net cost uh, if you don't already kind of suck up all the uh, renewables curtailment with these other technologies. So that's a little bit of color on why this supply curve is shaped the way it is and some of the step changes that we're seeing in the presented cost effectiveness here. I think it's important to compare and contrast the cost of these demand flexibility levers that we've modeled with the cost of just balancing renewable variability with natural gas, because that is often spoken of in the same breath as investing in more renewables. I think we've, we've seen many announcements from utilities on, yes, we will invest in renewables, but we're also going to invest in natural gas capacity as kind of a flexible ramping backup supply. Um, so, so what we did in this chart then is compare and contrast the, the relative cost of doing that. So the, the farthest left chart uh, sorry, the farthest left column contains the annualized costs of each of the demand flexibility levers that we modeled. So there's, uh, I think, five low-cost levers that were kind of on the far left of the supply curve that don't actually add that much cost. Uh, so these are things like water heating, um, plug loads, EV charging uh, controls, et cetera. Um, they don't add that much cost. And then we're, the other three that are shown here, commercial air conditioning, ice storage, residential air conditioning, ice storage, and residential heat, ceramic, thermal storage, those are a little bit more expensive. So what we've done in the second bar here is shown kind of the, the break-even, I'll call it, the break-even cost-effective portfolio of uh, the demand flexibility levers that together provide enough benefits to provide kind of returns at the social discount rate. Uh, back to the grid based on, and then this is the third bar, if you do, if you do this portfolio of demand flexibility, spend, you know, a little under $2 billion a year enabling demand flexibility in these loads, you can avoid, you know, call it $400 billion a year, uh, sorry, $400 million a year of gas-fired power plant operations, and then, uh, you know, one and a half billion dollars a year of uh, natural gas fired capacity. So the, the two benefits that we're modeling here are load shifting to avoid curtailment and avoid gas fire generation uh, operations, and then load shifting to reduce peak net load and minimize gas fired capacity to back up the renewables. So, so this portfolio of demand flexibility offers about 80% of the net benefits that Kara presented in the last slide. So we're still getting a significant portion of uh, carbon reduction, of peak load reduction, of curtailment reduction with this kind of, I'll call it again, break-even portfolio cost-effective demand flexibility when compared to the alternative of a natural gas-fired power plant backup strategy. So there was a question that came in on whether, whether there was a reason we didn't include large central chiller system air conditioning. Um, I think the short 
answer to that is that one, to some extent we did by modeling ice storage. However, if the question is more around uh, why didn't we model kind of different control strategies using building thermal mass in central chiller systems or kind of other variable air volume demand response approaches that we've seen some companies roll out in the last five years. Um, we didn't model those because they were difficult to assess the technology's potential at scale at kind of the state level of Texas because of different climate zones because of a mismatch between temperature data that we had access to versus just air conditioning load data, which, which we did have access to. So it, it was a simplifying assumption that we made and it ended up that the ice storage uh, technology was simpler to uh, model essentially. Uh, as we comment in our paper, if we would have modeled kind of these thermal mass control strategies, we anticipate that the uh, air conditioning flexibility would come in at a lower cost but also perhaps a lower potential because we don't necessarily see as much of a shifting potential with building thermal mass as has been demonstrated by ice storage. Um, so if, if there's follow-up questions on that, I'm happy to address them as we get to the end, but that's kind of the short answer of how we chose and modeled the air conditioning control strategies in this study. And I think there's, there's another question um, that, I, uh, that I just saw come across and we'll get to that uh, in, in a few slides here. So I wanted to highlight that we, um, we, we think our analysis is fundamentally conservative. I want to talk through three reasons why that's the case. First, we only modeled two value, uh, two value streams of flexibility. Uh, we, as, as I said earlier, we modeled avoided curtailment and thus avoided gas fire generation and then avoided peak capacity. Um, there are a whole stack of other benefits that demand flexibility has been proven to deliver, including decreased line losses, uh, ancillary service market participation, support for resilience as part of a microgrid. All of these things, which we chose not to quantify out of simplicity and conservatism, can add significantly to the investment uh, cost benefit analysis for demand flexibility technologies. And so we could see greater adoption as kind of you net out more things from that supply curve of avoided curtailment. We also didn't look at industrial loads. We didn't necessarily have uh, great data available on demonstrated technologies in the industrial sector that can uh, shift load at scale. However, we are aware of pilot programs on water pumping, on uh, kind of mass movement at mine sites to, to kind of shift the timing of energy consumption and, and a whole range of, you know, even, you know, more kind of cutting edge approaches with large scale energy management and industrial sites. So for simplicity, we, we omitted those, um, but if we included them, uh, we anticipate that there would be significant uh, curtailment reduction potential there as well. And then finally, this is kind of a sum up of, of that last point. We really only looked at solutions that have already been proven in the marketplace. Um, we are not looking at kind of really emerging technologies, including the advanced uh, load control strategies for thermal mass space cooling, th thermal mass enabled space cooling demand flexibility that I referenced earlier. Um, we're, we're really only looking at things that have been demonstrated in the market. Um, we're, we're ascribing future costs to those, but we're, we're really not tapping the full stack. So what, is this, what does this mean? Uh, we, we see five kind of key conclusions from this and implications for, for folks in our sector. Uh, from the perspective of grid planners, including utilities, including ISO and RTO system planners and operators, um, there, there's a kind of a, a pressing rationale based on the results of this study and, and other studies that, that have come out in the past on this kind of technology that there, there's a real opportunity to include demand flexibility as a resource in grid planning. Um, because if you don't, there, there's a risk that demand flexibility is cost effective kind of by itself in many cases. So. I, I have a smart thermostat, but I don't have a smart thermostat because my utility told me it's valuable. I have a smart thermostat because I enjoy being able to turn up my heat from my phone. 
but that is actually a grid resource and it costs money. And if, and if that's not recognized in the grid planning process, there's a real risk of building a bunch of natural gas fired capacity and a bunch of demand flexibility all, you know, that are all essentially providing the same services. So we, we see a huge role for an expanded um, treatment of demand flexibility and planning. The second implication is, is largely for policymakers and then to the extent that utilities and commissions are implementing policymaker decisions. We, we have seen in the past language, as I mentioned earlier, around hesitance to set high renewables targets because of this idea of a, an economic or a technical limit to renewable energy integration. And what we've shown is that that limit is a moving target. We don't necessarily need to have one number in our minds and stick to it. Um, because as we've demonstrated with this study, there's a suite of technologies that can push that limit upwards. Um, I, I like to reflect on the fact that when I started working in the energy industry, utilities routinely uh, put out press releases or, or gave quotes to the newspaper around their limit for renewable energy integration being less than 10% of annual energy. And now where I live in Colorado and, and in other utilities around the country, um, utilities are setting goals or, or investment targets in their IRPs for 50%, even 70% renewable energy in some of the Great Plains states. Uh, so, so we've seen kind of this paradigm shift in how we think about renewables and demand flexibility can be a technology that, that can help push that number upward across more of the country. The third implication is, you know, around both utilities and project developers themselves, I think to get around this near-term issue of revenue uh, erosion and value deflation from renewable energy, you can consider a portfolio approach between renewables and demand flexibility to kind of provide more of that, I'll call it portfolio level constant resource that, that would maybe earn more revenue in the market than just a pure renewables play, for example. There's a role for regulators to play in adjusting utility incentives to um, encourage non-capital investments. So what, what we've shown is that a majority of the cost-effective demand flexibility that we show in this study is, is very capital light. It is essentially a microchip on an existing load. If a utility compares that under traditional cost of service regulation, if a utility compares that to an investment in a natural gas-fired power plant, there is a natural incentive to invest under most circumstances in the United States in the higher capital cost option. And so by, by implementing some kind of performance-based regulation approaches or other incentive mechanisms for utilities to choose these kind of low capital cost solutions, we can start to um, tap this, this market opportunity more dramatically. And then finally, there, there's kind of a role for expanded customer incentives to participate in demand flexibility offerings, either via time varying rate uh, or other granular rates, or via aggregator programs that insulate the customer from rates, but still, you know, respond to grid signals for peak reduction in renewable energy integration. Um, so these these are kind of five top level thoughts on what this means. You know, kind of in the long term, our study was for 2050, but also in the near term as we seek to accelerate adoption of this resource demand flexibility that that can be an important part of a low cost low carbon electricity system. So I'm gonna to flip to the last slide here. I saw a bunch of questions come in, so I'm just gonna uh, reflect on those for a second and, and then I'll, we'll start answering them uh, in just one minute once I've kind of wrapped my head around the range of questions we've gotten. So there was a question from one of the attendees in Minnesota. Um, essentially, the question is, does the result, do the results of our study look different in Minnesota or, or other northern climates, for example, that have a different resource portfolio, so a different mix of solar and wind, for example, and also a different load portfolio, so I'm going to say less summer air conditioning peak, more, you know, especially potentially in the future, more winter heating peak as, as more and more heating loads are electrified, um, growing EVs. So, so the first question that I'll address is, you know, does this look different in northern climates? I, I think the short answer is, 
yes, we haven't done the analysis for all climate zones of the country. Um, but in Minnesota, especially, and, and especially given my understanding of some of the utility programs already operating in Minnesota that are designed to take advantage of, you know, specifically low cost wind at night. Um, it, it does look different, but, but the same set of technologies, perhaps in a different ratio is essentially going to provide the same order of magnitude of benefits to the system. Again, we haven't done the math, but um, I think that, you know, what we've seen from utilities in Minnesota suggests that there are many ways to capture the benefits of demand flexibility, even if you don't have the exact resource mix that we're modeling in Texas. The second part of the question was, well, what if you're not in Texas? What if you're in a broader ISO, RTO, um, and you can actually kind of export some of this variability, right, and rely on the transmission network to balance across a wider geographic area? That is a that is a huge benefit to having broader transmission connection, and is a really important part of making sure that renewables integration at scale doesn't rely necessarily on demand flexibility. Um, so we chose to model Texas because it is in many ways the hardest case within the continental U.S. to to get right because it is essentially an electric island um, for both the eastern and the western interconnects. The, the role of demand flexibility kind of remains the same, but I'm going to say that the existing transmission network can also alleviate many of the imbalance issues that, that demand flexibility otherwise would. So I'll go into the, the next question. The question was around if um, transmission grid usage, if, if the net peak reduction of, co uh, of transmission usage is included, would our results change? Um, so this, this study was really meant to do a cost comparison of gas-fired power plant avoided peak. So I'll, 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 I'll clarify one of our assumptions, which starts to answer this question. Um, we assumed a value of avoided peak reduction at $120 per kilowatt per year. Where that came from is essentially $90 per kilowatt per year that we um, estimate to be the cost of new entry, kind of the lower bound cost of new entry of a gas-fired combustion turbine, and that's from EIA data, the, the inputs to their annual energy outlook. The, so that's $90. The $30 comes from kind of the, the, any adders on that, some of which are coming from T&D, and we did a meta review in our 2015 Economics of Demand Flexibility paper that, that got us to that number. So to some extent, we already have incorporated T&D avoided cost reduction. Um, however, I think it's wrapped into that $120 per kilowatt year. And if you actually look at market rate cost of new entry, some of those are higher even on the generation side. So we're probably being fairly conservative there as well. <clears throat> There's a question around how did we develop a view on market willingness to be engaged in demand flexibility? Um, I think that's a really good question, and it's really important to, to not just assess the kind of core economic case of the technology, but also the customer adoption angle. Um, we, we did a few things to address this. We, we interviewed technology developers and deployers to understand kind of where they saw their market going. We also, as, as you'll see in the report, benchmarked our understanding of technology capabilities and on, on customer adoption and value to the grid off of um, existing programs that we saw already being announced, already achieving load reductions and curtailment or load shifting, I'll say, at scale. So we didn't necessarily address this directly, but at the same time, we did, you know, again, use technologies that we believe can be, you know, marketed successfully and, and engage customers at the level that they want to be engaged at. Um, there's, a there's a few questions here. I'm just, yeah, so we, we've got a couple more questions to address. I'd invite any more, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through three more questions that have showed up on the screen and then, and then we, can, we can wrap. Um, one question, does the study include topology or network congestion? 
The short answer is no, it does not. Um, so we did not assess the, on the one hand, kind of the deliverability of renewable energy within Texas. Um, we, we kind of made the assumption that the existing transmission network or transmission expansion through 2050 would allow this renewable energy to be delivered and not curtailed. On the other hand, we did, we also didn't model the benefits of demand flexibility at targeted grid topology specific avoided costs that, that could really change our cost benefit analysis. So we probably left a little bit of cost on the table, but we also left a lot of value on the table by ignoring that topic. Um, does the study include utility scale storage? We did not. We, we intentionally left utility scale or even behind the meter battery energy storage out of the analysis to, I think, really make the point that in many ways, demand flexibility can do exactly the same thing uh, when it comes to renewable curtailment and peak load reduction. So, so that was a constant choice to have demand flexibility in many ways compete against batteries. And I think one of the interesting conclusions of this study, if you're a, a battery developer, is that if these technology costs that we're assuming are realized, then the market for batteries might be under threat, um, especially behind the meter. So happy to, happy to follow up with folks interested in that angle. We didn't highlight that in the report, but I think it's an important conclusion out of this work. Finally, the question is around, if we, if we conclude that demand flexibility is, is lower cost than gas, do we include reliability attributes? Um, for example, not all demand flexibility can serve fast ramping, frequency regulation, and other essential reliability services. Um, we don't specifically model most of those. We do, we do look at ramping, but only at an hourly time scale. So I, I, that's probably not what the question means by fast ramping. Um, I, would, I would argue that demand flexibility has been shown uh, in either pilots or in scale deployment to provide both fast ramping and frequency regulation services. And, and to the, the person who asked this question, please, please follow up with, with me on that if you'd like more detail. But, but there's a, a range of studies based on utility pilots and then again, scale deployment that demonstrate that under the right kind of aggregation scheme, demand flexibility can actually provide uh, many of these essential reliability services that are currently provided by gas-fired power plants across most of the country. Um, and and I'll, I'll tease a little bit uh, a forthcoming RMI report that dives into that body of information and actually um, assesses, you know, to what extent a portfolio of demand flexibility, renewable energy, and battery energy storage can provide all of these essential reliability services. So, um, maybe the longer answer is uh, we will follow up in more detail with a forthcoming report. Um, okay, so there was one more question that came in around the reducing peak usage of the transmission grid. I think I think I answered that. Maybe, maybe I wasn't clear. We do include that um, in the $120 per kilowatt year avoided cost. Um, value that we ascribe to net load peak net load reductions um, if, if you mean reducing peak usage and therefore reducing line losses or reducing congestion rents we don't get into that level of detail we do get into avoided capacity costs on the tnd system and that's included in our uh, capacity assumption so i've been speaking for quite a while uh, if there are any more questions please continue to type them in um, I would also offer, Kara, if you have any kind of final thoughts or reactions to some of the questions that came up that I didn't address, I would, I would welcome your comments as well. Um, yeah, I would just add uh, back to the question about looking at um, the willingness of customers to engage in flexibility and to participate. Um, I think that what our analysis really was trying to look at was the potential of demand flexibility at scale, at, um, at very large numbers of deployment. And so to show the potential benefits um, and so those were worked into the assumptions um, 
but once again, of course, customer behavior and how customer incentives and utility programs are structured are going to play a very important role in um, getting participants engaged in the future. Great. Thanks, Kara. I see one more question. Uh, did you consider the potential limits of the distribution grid to provide these grid-wide services? So I, I'm not, I, I would love to follow up with the person who asked this. I, I think that the answer is yes, because what we've essentially done is demonstrate that through shifting load kind of at the far end, at the far edges of the distribution grid, we can, you know, essentially have demand act as a giant battery for central scale renewables. In, in, in almost all cases that I can imagine, that will reduce peak net load on the distribution grid. And so kind of from an infrastructure perspective, we, we wouldn't necessarily see any problems. There's other issues around control and kind of the scalability of existing um, data systems, for example, even existing market clearing mechanisms that would be required to actually enable this set of technologies to respond to grid level signals. Um, we did not specifically look at that. However, again, given the momentum we've seen in the industry around software development and around some of the efforts at ISOs around the country looking at new market mechanisms for integrating distributed energy resources, that we, we don't see any issue with that, especially in kind of the decade plus time frame. that it is essentially an IT challenge and, and uh, we are quite good in this country at addressing IT challenges. Um, so I, again, I'd love to follow up if I didn't address your question fully. Uh, okay, yeah, the final question is actually very similar to that. How could this set of resources um, most often deployed by third-party developers actually be trusted operationally by the utility? Um, again, I'll point to the success of companies that have been acting in this space already, kind of providing turnkey solutions to utilities that in many ways act like a power plant. You push a button, you see a demand reduction, you can track it, you can measure it, you can verify it. That needs to increase in scale and complexity for what we've modeled to be true. But again, we've seen deployments in the market that already suggest this is possible and that, that it's now just a question of scale. So I haven't seen another question come in. I'll, I'll give everyone maybe 30 more seconds and then we'll, we'll wrap up the presentation. All right, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, really appreciate the time today. And with that, we're gonna wrap up the presentation. Um, you can reach us with questions or feedback at elab at rmi.org. You can download the report on RMI's website. Kara and my email addresses are attached to that report. You can follow up with us directly. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and have a great day. Thank you.